All right, we're back again with another episode of the philosophy of art and science. A lot of the episodes lean towards the art, so sometimes we got to get into the science. And today I want to talk about the science of COVID-19, the so-called novel virus in the series. Uh, maybe some people call it SARS-2 as, as well, but the locals call it either Corona or the Rona. And... I want to start this conversation off with the idea of Nassim Nicholas Taleb, Yanir Baryam, and Joe or Joseph Norman. They released a paper back in January. It's one paper, it's one page. The second page has some footnotes, but it's titled Systemic Risk of Pandemic via Novel Pathogens, Coronavirus, a note. It's a very tiny paper they published back in January, warning everybody in the world about this. In The Black Swan and in talks about this, Nassim years ago predicted that the interconnectedness of the globe through globalism and the amount that we travel is going to make us a more fragile global society and that, he, and that a, a, a pandemic or this type of plague could be very damaging in ways that it wouldn't have been to the ancients and that sometimes we have to act not on what we know, but what we know that we don't know. And so that was kind of my basis. And those people are sometimes called libertarians, but they change their politics based off of the scale that they're talking about, globe versus nation versus you know state versus county versus city. I also had a lot of people on my social media timelines who are libertarians with just an instinct to be skeptical of government mandates of everything. So it's it's an interesting question of what does the science say? What do the epidemiologists say? What do the complexity scientists say versus what is the appropriate action at various levels? Today, we have a repeat guest, our brother, Jonathan Rios, who is a Rona survivor so why don't sure. you tell us your experience and then maybe your thoughts before and after in, in case they changed or stayed the same yeah so i mean part of um you know with what you just spoke of part of um both my experience and just myself as a person i would say i'm someone who changes his mind constantly and Right off the bat, for a lot of people, that's like, okay, well, how much can we trust this guy? If he's constantly <laughs> fine, is he a political flip-flopper? Like, what's his agenda? Um, but for me, it's just about updating. You know, I, I'm not, there are very few beliefs that I have that I'm sold on 100%. Um, there's almost none um, other than perhaps the belief in God. Um, there's very few things that I take as completely solid. There's a couple different reasons why, and I think this is something that, that really matters a lot in terms of the debate around um, coronavirus, our response to it, how we protect ourselves, a lot, a lot of different things that are going on in this political climate um, where, where everything has become a political battle. Um, mm -hmm. regar regardless of how it's affecting people, you know, it's, it's just everything is chalked up as, well, this is just to get political points. Um, and, I, and, you know, we're entering, I think, a very dangerous stage of our society where instead of looking for pragmatic solutions, we're just pointing the finger back and forth. Um, and there's a lot of inaction that's happening as well as a result of this. So um, there's, a, there's an interesting book called The Half-Life of Facts that took medical research and theories and facts and what have you, you know, a lot of medical information that had been collected over at a period of, uh, I believe, about 80 years. And what the man who wrote the book did was go through and meticulously catalog instances where information changed, where mm -hmm. things that we believed, and this was medical research, right? This is not some subjective thing. This is us through clinical trials, through 
observation, through testing, over the scientific over, method, over, right? Through the scientific method, not art, through science, looking at what is the truth about health and medicine and the human body. And what he found is that in this instant, about it was a period of the half life of facts referring to how long does it take for half of what we believe to die more or less, right? Looking at half-life coming from uh, isotopes, right, in, in elements um, and the half-life of different substances, you know, what, how long does it take for something to die by 50%? And so for facts in the medical field, and this was not like way long ago, this was from like the turn of the century to, I believe, um, shortly before the turn of the century, being the 1900s, um, to about 1960 or 70, I believe. Not 100% true. But it was a period of about 80 years. He cataloged that the half-life of facts during that period was about 47 years. Wow. Modern medicine. And that half of what they believed from shortly before the 1900s to up about 1870 Every 47 years, about half of the information that they believed to be true changed in some significant way to where the old information was disproven. Now, why does that matter? Well, that matters to me on many levels because it means that we can't trust what we believe too deeply, right? We need to be looking to reconfirm the information and things that we believe constantly. And with something like the pandemic that we're currently going through, that cycle is sped up, right? It's, it's a novel, to some degree, a novel virus, right? It, it, it's a mutation of old viruses that we've already come in contact with, but it's doing new things. It's spreading in different ways. Um, but at the same time, medical researchers and epidemiologists have been able to discover a lot of information about this virus in this short period of about six months. So things that were believed about the virus in the beginning have changed, and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that people were trying to um, intentionally dissuade us. There's probably some of that out there, um, and I'll get into some of that as well. About yeah. How, how, you know, the powers that be are manipulating the situation. Yeah, and that, that uh, just a quick aside, is I think, and we'll talk about it with like Fauci and stuff and some of the statements he's made, is the difference between you know, how has the science changed versus the level of honesty they want to have with the public at large regarding the science? Right. So, you know, um, from my personal experience, um, you know, I didn't get hit that hard myself. Um, I contracted it. I had a fever. Um, I don't think my fever got above maybe a hundred. Um, again, I'm 30, right. I'm, I'm, in good health for the most part. I've gotten regular health screenings and everything's in working order. Blood you fast? Blood. I think that's important. Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, now I'm, you know, with the baby and with uh, just my schedule being thrown off by having a son, which definitely throws a wrench in, in all of our plans. Um, yeah. uh, not as much. So, you know, there's also some level of that where my sleep schedule hasn't been as good. Right. I know that there's certain things I've done recently that have probably compromised my immune system to some degree. But again, this is a novel virus. So when the body, one thing that we do know for sure is that when the body comes in contact with a virus that it's never seen before, um, it's going to get affected. Um, whether it's a mild reaction or a major reaction, it's going to get affected. Um, so I got, I got sick. Um, I was sick for a couple of weeks, um, had fever off and on for about a week. Again, it was somewhat mild. Um, I had a consistent cough. I had congestion in my chest, um, was coughing throughout the day regularly. Now I'm pretty much completely clear. It's been about a, a month since I got a positive result. And I recently went out and took another test, which I'm waiting on the results for to clear that I'm negative. Um, my wife had also gotten sick. She got tested again recently. Didn't get tested the first time around, but had the same symptoms. Her fever hit 102, um, but she she was, you know, even though it's been about six months, she or not six months, uh, three months, she had a C-section, which again also, 
you know, affect the body and compromise mm-hmm. your your health and your immune system to a certain degree. So she had her own challenges, which is maybe why she got hit a little bit harder. Um, but we're, you know, we're both in the clear now. Um, and so- and to, to just pause and reflect on in the clear, have you heard anything or did any of the people who tested you positive say anything about are you contagious once you're clear or after the fact? So this is something from my own research. Yeah, um, the information that healthcare professionals are given, um, I think is intentionally somewhat vague because there's, there's also fear among healthcare companies and professionals that if they say something wrong, right, there's going to be a malpractice suit. If they, if they try to over give information that right now, again, is still on shaky ground about how the virus works and the level of contagiousness and all that. Um, so they were just basically like, hey, you got to quarantine for a minimum of 14 days. Um, we weren't really given much instruction past that. Um, we weren't even told to take a second exam. We did that because we wanted to confirm that we were no longer viral and that yeah. the most responsible thing to do. Um, but when you dig into the research right now, um, it, the reason why they're using that period is because one distinction that needs to be made is that the coronavirus and COVID, which is the disease, are two different things right? It's like HIV and AIDS. HIV isn't what people get sick from. It's what eventually blossoms into AIDS, which is then what compromises their immune system and causes illness. Same thing with COVID. Coronavirus is the virus that causes COVID-19, which is the infection, which is the respiratory infection. Um, But it's not, it's it's what infects people and what spreads you can have the disease and many people have had symptoms for months after they got the virus. They were no longer, no longer viral months later, right? Or even weeks later, the best information that we have is that the virus can survive in the body for up to 14 days. Mm -hmm. Um, As of now, that's the best information we have. That could change. They could find more outlier cases where it survived longer in the body Um, but for the most part, it's a 14 day window where the virus has to both give you the disease and spread to others. So that's, yeah, that's why I was asking is like, I was wondering if, you know, we get to some threshold where 70 or 80% of us, let's say contract it and survive. Does that mean, you know, you get some sort of ticket that shows you've gone through that process which then lets you no longer wear a mask. Because as I understand it, the, the greatest reason for the mask is to encourage, and this is what I understood from the systemic risk paper, it's to encourage this good behavior because we don't know who's a spreader and who's not. And right. when these, these things uh, multiply, they multiply in factors that are inexorable and exponential so that if the- you knew for sure that you couldn't pass it, it wouldn't make much more sense for you to continue wearing a mask. Um, but, th- but, but if we don't know, then it is a good idea. Cause if we right. don't know, then we just got to do it as a precaution. This is not right. that big of a deal. So, yeah. So again, and part of what they're combing through right now is, um, you know, how good are the antibodies? Right. And even if you don't get reinfected, right. Because you have antibodies, does that necessarily preclude you from receiving and respreading the virus again, right? Because even though you might have antibodies, you can catch the virus again, not get sick because you have antibodies now to COVID. But be a spreader. But be a spreader of the coronavirus. Now, again, <laughs> that, that is still something that, that, they're, that, that we need more research around. Um, but it's certainly possible that you could be fully immune, not fully immune, but you could have some level of immunity to COVID, which is the disease, and still catch the virus again. And that's, again, that's a level of discussion that um, I'm not seeing in the public sphere. Um, I don't, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, if you've seen different, 
but other I, than I've seen it in a in a few research, circles. Other than yeah. looking at the medical research, especially yeah. if you go to Twitter, which Twitter is obviously not the greatest place for uh, educated discussion, unfortunately. Um, you know, it's more quick, witty takes and anger. Yeah, so it's functional, right? You can find it. So like Joe Norman, I found right. through Twitter, through right. the RWRI, the Real World Risk Institute, which is run by Nassim Taleb. And he's a homesteader in New Hampshire, along with his wife. And so through him and Joel Salatine, the farmer who was on uh, the JRE recently and also in the past, what I have come to understand, and this is the scariest aspect of it, if you're most attached to the status quo. In our last discussion about debate, you know, we yeah. talked about the quo a lot in terms of injustice and how the people who are benefiting from the injustice the most are those who want to perpetuate that and who have the most fear of what changes. So you and I are people who reside in metropolitan cities, some of the biggest cities in the United States. And so what these homesteaders are actually arguing and these farmers is that the size of our cities, of our cosmopolitan areas have been artificially propped up to this point in history. And what the uh, COVID is exposing is that perhaps going forward, it's not livable to live in cities like this. And we may just need to live in, in smaller towns. I don't know what the optimal size is going to end up being, but that the multi-million person city is not going to be feasible, especially if you, if you have all these invisible spreaders se seemingly for a long time and then potentially unforeseen new, you know, new mutations. Right. And, that, and that's the thing, right, is that <clears throat> the situation that we're living in, the density of population um, opens us up to a lot of risk, um, not just in terms of existing disease, which again, how long have we been living with the flu? We still, in the United States alone, um, 30 to 50 million cases per year, right? About 10 percent, you know, at least 10 percent of the population without fail pretty much every single year is getting infected. And then of those, we're seeing around forty to 60,000 deaths per year. Um, I caught it twice in a year one time, the American strain and then the Ethiopian strain. I was right. out for one to two weeks twice in one year. Right. And this is, you know, that, that's something that's been around for 100 years now. Um, so there's that, right, which coronavirus, COVID may be joining the ranks of that in terms of a persistent disease which may not be as deadly as something like a tuberculosis, but that can sustain itself for longer periods of time. In fact, when you study viruses, um, the less deadly a virus is, the more it can persist, right? It's actually not very useful for a virus to kill its host because then it can't spread. Um, so the viruses like the flu, like COVID, um, which isn't not deadly, but less lethal than things like you know, tuberculosis or AIDS, um, have, polio. polio, have a much smallpox, have a much greater chance of sticking around long term like the flu has. Um, and in that case, with the density of our population, these persistent viruses can then morph and jump to a next level of, of you know, fatality where they are you know, we get an outburst. Um, you know, is it going to slow us down much? Uh, I don't know. Um, you know, for for the crowd that believes in the spirit, which I think we're, you and I are certainly among that crowd, um, you know, there are spiritual leaders out there um, across a variety of faiths who you know, in their connection to God have, in their connection to the spirit world, um, have gleaned that this virus is here to challenge our greed, to challenge our arrogance, um, and that 
as long as we don't receive the message and learn the lesson that we're supposed to learn from this moment, not only is this virus going to persist, but the situation is going to get worse. And, you know, we're just two guys discussing this information. I'm not a doctor, an epidemiologist. Neither, neither am I. Yeah. So what, what makes us qualified to engage in this discussion at all, other than just being public intellectuals? Um, you know, again, from our previous conversation, I go back to debate. One of the greatest gifts that it gave me, that I think it's given many people, is our ability to dig through information and read the tea leaves to some degree. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm necessarily <laughs> right. Um, and again, I'm happy to be wrong um, because I'm, I'm not... I'm not trying to move public opinion, really, with, with what I'm saying. I'm trying to give people something to think about so that they can then, for themselves, challenge the information, challenge the views that they have and that they're receiving from their leaders. And so with coronavirus, what you're looking at is that right now we're already at around um, 4 million cases, which is over 1% of the population in the United States, right? Which the amount is, of people who voted for Gary Johnson in 2016. Yes, sir. Um, which is already, right, we're seeing the worst of the spread globally, right? There's no other country to this point that has had the level of penetration, not even Italy, um, that has had the level. They had it quicker from the start, but they took more extreme measures. So to this point, in the six or so months that we've been Seeing this situation unfold, um, the U.S., which were one of the more carefree modern societies, right? We're one of the more carefree, hyper-developed societies, right? When you're talking about metropolitan areas, when you're talking about big cities, we have more of them than most countries, and we're more lax than most countries with our policies within those cities, right? And it's what people have always... You know, I was listening to the song Summertime by Will Smith recently, and it's what's idealized about America, that carefree, do what you want, you know, from the barbershop to the beach, right? You know, just this, this feeling that we own the world, that we own our destiny. Yeah. And there is something really beautiful about that, um, but that carefree attitude, which has bled into arrogance, which has bled into greed, that's, that's what's being challenged by this virus is what a lot of spiritual leaders are speaking to. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the lesson isn't hitting home hard enough for the majority of our society. Um, and even for the minority that's super vocal, they're swaying public opinion. They're swaying people's behavior. And so... Um, I think it is, you know, the, the thing about a lot of conspiracy theories that I look at, um, you know, about how the virus is manufactured, which it might have been, right? We do have different places around the world that study infectious diseases. Um, one in Wuhan. One in Wuhan. Um, but it's not the only place. Um, throughout the world where they're studying diseases, and, and this is well documented, this is not like a secret, where they're studying potentially new viruses by creating them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not unique to Wuhan. It may have happened there. It may have come from a lab. Um, it may have happened naturally on its own because that's the reason we're studying these mutations is because they're likely. We're using historical data. We're using the knowledge that we have and going, okay, we know this is going to happen again because it keeps happening, right? It's not, if we stop studying diseases, we would not be better off. Anyone who believes that is sorely misinformed, right? Talk to the people who survived polio. Talk to the people who survived smallpox. Talk to the people who survived the influenza pandemic of 1918, right? Us being ignorant of the fact that there are diseases out there and not engaging with them in a lab setting is not going to save us from squat. Yeah, right. no, that's a that's a non-starter. I think the only legitimate concerns and argumentations are about who should be funding the that research. Yeah, and which... and that gets into people's politics, and again, that goes right. into scale as well. Like the first question is: Is it something that the government should be doing, or is it something 
that the private sector should be doing or the nonprofit sector. Then the next question is, what level of government are we talking about? If it's a global risk, do we establish some sort of new world order that funds this? Or do we do it at the national level? Do we do it at the state level, county, city level? You know, those are. Yeah, which again, those are the legitimate questions. But a lot of people are saying like, you know, that we're, I don't necessarily believe that that this was done intentionally to infect the population right now if you're saying hey people are going to capitalize on the fact that there's a disease and that people are getting infected for sure right a lot of people are pointing towards bill gates and the fact that he's funded all this medical research <laughs> he's a guy who has seen patterns right just like he did with microsoft he's a guy who has seen patterns of development and said, okay, medicine is actually a really profitable field, right? If I take some of my billions and fund real epidemiologists, real medical researchers, not me, right? But I fund just like any entrepreneur in any field, I invest in technology. Mm -hmm. When a virus comes around and we need a vaccine for the entire population, I'm going to benefit from that, but it's also going to help a large number of people. So to say that it's impossible, right, that he has, that he's not, that basically to say that the only reason he could be doing it is because he's trying to control the population is silly because even if you look at the, he's a smart guy, right? It's not an effective delivery method for population control. If you look at the bubonic plague, right, which is, in history, one of the deadliest diseases we've ever seen, it wiped out about two to three percent of the population. When you look at the the chart of population growth in history, it was a blip, right? So disease, one, is not an effective means of population control. It's an effective means of social chaos, not an effective means of population control, nor would some type of vaccine. If they really wanted to get to us, our fast food is a lot more accessible than any level of vaccines. If you want to see what people are going to take in mass, we already know what a perfect delivery method is. If you're out there super villain thinking of a delivery method, fast food, I would say, is probably a better route. Yeah, I try not looking into the Bohemian Grove too much because it's a very scary world. But I, I did watch some Alex Jones yesterday because he interviewed Alex Lee Moyer, whose film uh, um, That Feel When No Girlfriend I reviewed recently on my channel. So I wanted to see how she was on that on his program. And I watched some and he he went in on a whole <laughs> monologue to a Jeremiah against Bill Gates. And, you know, a lot of it is is nonsensical. But I do have a deep skepticism of of the man, but I, I yeah, I don't go to the cartoonish villain portrayals of him. I I think that you know IP is illusory, and so the way he gained his wealth in terms of Microsoft, I think there's an artificial nature to it, and the way in which he's using trying to use IP for these vaccines and you know to, to profit off of it, and the way in which he wants to test it on Africans first. Those those things stick out to me as as reasons for me to have a default position of suspicion against him. But it doesn't mean I go all the way down the rabbit hole and and like you said, paint him as some sort of like James Bond villain or Austin Powers villain. Right. In terms of methodology, there's again, there's plenty always the question in terms of methodology, right? You know, why does it need to be studied? Like, yeah, they're the hardest hit, but it's because of the social means of that group right when you go down the down the poverty line right when you look at things like food deserts when you look at things like you know unequal access to health care there's a lot of factors that go into the fact that certain populations are being the hardest hit by this um, and it has way more to do than you know they're genetically predisposed to being hit the hardest by covid um, and there's so so there's there's definitely a lot to question in terms of methods. Um, you know, what is the ultimate goal? Is it population control? Is it that you want to wipe out um, you know African American or African descended people from existence? 
I definitely don't think it's that. Um, you know, is it is it is it questionable that we're not studying this equally across groups? That that's not the proposed method. That that's something we can dig into more, and that I think has more to do with subtle bias, um, which is a whole other conversation um, that people don't want to get into when it comes to racism um, and systemic racism um, that I think is a lot deeper than what, you know, than even police brutality. Um, so, like the underlying assumptions behind how you choose to research. Right, right. Yeah, there's some data scientists I follow on Twitter one Ethiopian one, particularly in the UK. Um, I think her name is Ababich. I might be bu butchering it, but sh her work is all about how, you know, the people who are creating these artificial intelligence programs are worshiping them and thinking that, you know, it's going to solve everything. But what they don't understand is sometimes what they're doing is they're putting their own biases that they have not questioned into the code itself. And so it's going to, what it's going to do is actually just enshrine the status quo's injustices for a longer time and for a greater amount of people. So, so a lot of the work she does is try to, to highlight the ways in which those biases could enter. One, one of the um, kind of practical examples, in, in case people think what I'm saying is too nebulous, is how like these face ID apps would not be as good or or would not be designed for people with darker skin tones like simple things like that mm -hmm. yeah there's there's a lot again there's a lot to dig into there um to, to bring it back to you know bringing up why i brought up conspiracy theories mm -hmm. um i'm of the belief that we can't break the laws of the universe what i mean by that is that whether you are a believer in God or not, um, to me, life is a lot about math and physics, right? Both when it comes to the consequences of our actions, um, but as well as on a more grander and global scale, right? If the powers that be, whether they created this situation or are trying to manufacture a specific response to it, they cannot supersede what I believe to be God's will. Meaning that as much as they're trying to control the situation around the virus, and I'll give you an exa an easy example again to not be too nebulous, right? Um, the Defense Production Act, which Donald Trump invoked, to force certain domestic manufacturers such as 3M, right, that have giant domestic manufacturing capabilities. There were three or four companies that got forced through Defense Production Act, right, to create more uh, personal protective equipment, masks, gloves, et cetera. Sounds like a good thing, right? We're being overrun by this pandemic. Um, certain states are being hit by it harder. And so to facilitate access to resources so that they can better deal with the response to the pandemic, right? So that their hospitals aren't overwhelmed. Um, and so that people are getting access to the protective equipment that they need, he invoked the Defense Production Act, which basically means that these manufacturers produce exclusively for the federal government, masks, gloves, and other protective equipment at cost, right? So just, just to play with some easy numbers, Right. These aren't the real numbers, but let's say they were getting masks for 10 cents a piece. Right. Well, is the federal government supposed to profit off of these supplies? Probably not. Right. They're supposed to turn around and provide them to the states that need them on an as needed basis. So mm -hmm. that, again, in, in terms of national security, right, the security of our health we can more effectively deal with this pandemic. Is that what the federal government does? No. What they do is they turn around and sell those supplies, again, at cost, to make it look like, hey, we're not the bad guys. They sell that at cost to third-party companies 
that have never existed before, that have no history of dealing with protective equipment, that have no history of, you know, ethical practices, they turn around and start selling them to the states on what has now famously become known as an eBay bidding type system, right? Lord have mercy. If California wants access to the supplies, they place a bid. And maybe the bid does start at 15 cents or 10 cents, right? Um, Maybe it starts at 30 cents. Whatever number they deemed, well, now that we've gone through the trouble of collecting the equipment and storing it, um, you know, maybe there's a little bit of a markup. Hey, it's still at cost. We promise. But now the states start bidding. And so now California puts in a bid. Well, but New Jersey and New York also need the supplies. So they put in a bid. And eventually it goes to the highest bidder at three to ten times the markup of what the original cost was of that item. Right? A middleman who is allowed to profit off of it, who has never existed before, who we can't really do much verifying of well, what's the legitimacy of this company, what's the standards in place, that and the inspector general who was put in place to oversee this process, who was voted on by a series of other inspector generals, was immediately fired by Donald Trump, and some rando was put in place who was a friend of his. Now, it's the height of nepotism, corporate capitalism, and what I would say in the truest economic, non-hyperbolic sense, fascism, meaning the government controlling a market economy, intervening to control what was a market economy. To give a a positive counterexample, this guy named Grant, who runs the strength company, it's a starting strength gym in, in Orange County, he broke down all of his stuff and started giving out all his equipment to his his gym participants. And then he immediately began making um, made at home, all American masks along with other items. And he's been selling these masks with like American flags on it himself, like really one individual who read again, uh, sorry to bring up his name so many times, but Nassim Taleb's anti-fragile book and said, I'm going to be better off in this chaos. And he's been he's been a he became a, a mask producer. This guy was a gym owner, and then he yeah. turned into that. And and there's no government money involved. It's all organic. It's all through his network. He just saw this gaping hole in the market and started selling it. So there's no worrying about like three, four, five layers of government bureaucracy the way in which you described, which is frankly just it's diabolical and despicable and and unbecoming of that rugged American individualism you described earlier. Yeah, it's, it's really troubling. And again, because I think a lot of people have been swayed into looking at politics as another version of sport, right? In that they care more about their team securing bragging rights than they care about interrogating what their team is doing, right? Um, you know, there are Americans, I think, like myself and yourself, who try to exist outside of party politics, but a lot of people are fully bought in, right? They believe that, hey, I've picked my party or my parents picked my party or someone that I admire is associated with this party. So I have to take it all hook, line, and sinker, right? There's no questioning, um, you know, if someone challenges someone who's representative of my party or has become associated with my party brand, they're challenging one of my teammates. And so I can't take that disrespect on any level. Um, Again, I look at the actual policy. I try to read the tea leaves by looking at the actual research and the data. And the truth is that we are being taken advantage of, right? The, this PPE grift, right? One of the greatest government grifts of all time. Um, Who knows where that money is going? And then we're talking about billions, um, not not a small number. We're talking about billions of dollars. Um, who knows it's, how much it's it'll going be to businesses who make less than I think five million dollars and have less than like two hundred employees, which is a lot of businesses. <laughs> right, right. But you know whether it's it's what has been done with the Defense Production Act or the loans that are being doled out. Um, in a lot of ways, as Americans, we're being taken advantage of. The money that we've put into the system is being taken advantage of. Um, and sucked out to 
to benefit a specific group of people. Um, Correct. But does that mean that the virus isn't real or that we should be more critical of Bill Gates and his funding of vaccines than we are of our own government and what they're doing to manipulate the situation? And, and what they're doing is leading to the insolvency of the Federal Reserve note known as the American dollar now. And, you know, I don't know when this precipice point is going to be. I, I'm not in the business of, of releasing prophecies like that. Um, but it's probably a good time to look at other currencies like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And, of course, the, the historic gold and silver and all that jazz, because What's scary is I've seen inflation even on a fast food level. I'm, I'm sorry to promote fast food here after you, you, you dug into it earlier. But I've, had, I've had some of it myself. Again, if they're, if they're going to take us out, it's yeah. a means of delivery. We don't <laughs> vaccines is not. There's too many people resistant to vaccines at this point. Uh, I, so I ate at Carl's Jr. the other day, and the bill ran up to like $1,500 or excuse me, $15 for just a burger and fries. And I was like, this is showing me that the purchasing power of the dollar in an immediate way that people could go verify is going down. And I, I asked my parents who do a lot of grocery shopping, how's it been? And they said they've seen hikes from like 100 to 150 to going up to 200 in terms of their normal grocery bills. And, and that's also partially our supply chain, right? Like right now, again, with this very real global pandemic happening, Right. And a lot of our supplies coming from China and other countries, right, shipping and production of these supplies because of these lockdowns. Right. We think about our jobs here, but our supplies, which typically come from other countries, they're also experiencing lockdowns and quarantines. And so that means a lot of people aren't working. That means a lot of stuff isn't being produced. That means Same. a lot of stuff being shipped. So the price of everything is going up. Um, and that's, that's both a matter of inflation and a matter of our supply chains being disrupted. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the foreign places again. So I was listening to Scott Adams, the Dilbert cartoonist, talk about this subject this morning in slight preparation of our talk. And one of the things he mentioned is that people raise the examples of islands like New Zealand, Hawaii, and Japan, also homogenous, you know, major homogenous places that aren't islands like Sweden as well. And then, you know, he brings up South Korea and people comparing those places to the United States. So one of the interesting things is, right, the United States is not an island per se. It might be on a very big island if you're talking about North America, but it's not an island per se. And there are a lot of people who come in and, of course, just the sheer size, the 300 million plus. Another thing he brought up is the whole idea of fake news versus homogenization and the partisanship you discussed earlier. So as you said, and I think it's an important point, you said you change your, your opinion a, not, a lot, but it's not just like Mitt Romney and Hillary Clinton putting their finger to the wind to see which way public polling is going so they could change their opinions on gay marriage or on healthcare or anything like that, but it's that you are not beholden to the Democrat Party. You're not beholden to the Republican Party. You're not beholden to the Libertarian Party. You're not beholden to the Green Party. You're examining the evidence, you know, as it is. And so, especially when you go to somewhere like Southeast Asia and you, you look at Japan and North Korea, there's been a culture, you know, from the earlier avian flus and, and SARS virus mutations of acknowledging that masks are helpful. I remember people used to make fun of Southeast Asians, at least in the Los Angeles area, when you see them um, wearing a mask. And, you know, it's it's kind of idiocy and ignorance because they had knowledge of something that the people making fun of them didn't have. And so the homogeneity of some of those societies, especially with some of their, you know, very strict immigration and and citizenship statuses that they give out, in addition to the kind of discipline in the culture to to wear masks as opposed to like you mentioned the american rebelliousness and then on top of the american rebelliousness the idea of the partisanship the deep divide between the people who vote what is it i think it's 40 percent of the populace actually votes 
and that 40% is mostly split into blue and red like the Cribs and the Bloods. But then you also have the 60% who like don't participate in electoral politics. So there, there's so many factors that, that Scott Adams was saying that makes the United States kind of unique in terms of, you know, how do you how do you approach all, all of these things? But so I, I wanted to bring that up so people don't think that uh, Mr. Rios is changing his mind willy nilly, but that you're responding to, you know, the best evidence that you have at the time. And that some other pla people in other places did that a too. A lot of times that means not caring a popular opinion, right? Like for me, you know, I had to change my Twitter bio because uh, to, you know, I start arguments with everyone. Because, <laughs> because the number of times, especially in the last several weeks, where I've been called you people by conservatives and liberals alike, um, you know, I, I don't, because I don't represent a banner. Can, can you give a little of an example? Why would conservatives think you're liberal and why would liberals think you're conservative? That's actually really funny. Well, co COVID has been a big part of it, right? I've been challenging people's COVID hysteria on both sides because what's unhelpful is that, again, we've got a vocal minority who are saying no mask, at all costs, right? This is a slippery slope to a tyrannical state, right? This one act of wearing a mask versus all the other, all the other stunts that our government pulls, right? Versus closing down business, versus closing down half of the economy. Masks is what we really need to focus on challenging the government on. Not the, not the mass closures of businesses, but actual, you know, social distancing, medically recommended practices. That's the one thing that's going to tear us down, right? So I'm challenging people on that side of the debate and saying, look, you're focused on the wrong thing, right? I tell them, look, I'm with you to a degree, but I think we need to be talking more about the, the, the closures of the economy in mass versus redirecting our behavior, right? Because if we can engage in smaller groups, right, things like classrooms, which is, again, something that more uh, what I guess you would consider liberal people who are all for the mask, right? I challenge them. I heard, a, I saw some lady post something about how, you know, they're glad they're not reopening the schools in Florida uh, because we're not going to participate in the genocide of our children. The genocide, right? <laughs> Throwing around terms like genocide like their candy, right? When it's a word that has significance and that has real meaning that you're watering down and devaluing other legitimate experiences of genocide by saying that if we reopen our schools, uh, we're sending our, our kids to the slaughter. For context, right? Again, the most recent information about COVID and the mortality rate among children nine and younger is 0.00016%. That's, wow. lo that's lower than the general mortality rate for children nine and under. Which is beautiful because I have seen people on Indeed and I've seen people on Craigslist posting that they want to begin having micro schools. Prenda is a company I was talking with back in January before we knew it was at this level. And I was trying to move into the micro schooling movement and micro schooling for those who don't know is just, it's an answer to the socialization question people have regarding homeschooling. It's homeschooling, but done in small groups of five to 10 students. And so I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. The state of Oklahoma's education just decided a totally different view of education, which I'm such a fan of. Right. And it's this, it's, it's this thing that, that, is going to piss off maybe liberals and conservatives, right? It's going to piss conservatives off because it's still using state money rather than just private education. But it's going to piss off the liberals who believe that the only way you can educate people is in public schools because they're going to be calculating what the cost of, of pupil is. And the way that they used vouchers before for private schools, they're going to give that money to the parents for homeschooling costs. And some of those formations may include small group homeschools or, or micro schools. That's amazing. That's, that's really awesome to hear. 
Um, but even that, right, <clears throat> per state, right, California may not, you know, you can try to do it under the table, so to speak, um, or, you know, behind closed doors, literally. Um, but will they allow something such as micro-schooling, right? Well, you have to be fearful of some government agent knocking on the door saying, what the hell is going on here? The way mm-hmm. that barber shops and salons have yeah. been getting raided when they're doing private one-on-one appointments, right? Not yeah. some business flooded with people, private one-on-one appointments, where many of them are requiring that their clients show up with proof that they're negative, right? Where they're following mm-hmm. every social distancing measure in the book and still the government is saying you are not allowed to engage in life, you are not allowed to engage in business, right? So that I think to me is a much more fruitful place to start our discussion than yeah. we shouldn't be wearing masks. And so I'm challenging both sides from different angles about their hysteria, which again, there's hysteria among mask wearers and there's hysteria among mask deniers but not neither of it is really helpful we're not allowing ourselves to have a nuanced discussion of what is the new normal because you're right the status quo as we know it the the america that will smith described in summertime we may not see it again for a very long time and and shout out to your moral support to him in this time of entanglement oh yes yes we got to support our boy Will Will is one that I I'm I'm a you know I'm a fan I'm a fan, um, but uh, yeah I I think you know really again the reason why I think we've been friends for so long um, and why we're having this type of discussion now is because we're interested in the nuance we're interested in the fine details rather than sweeping generalizations rather than party politics right. Um, and, and again, you know, from what debate has taught me about reading the tea leaves, looking at the situation, right? Looking at the fact that again, we're at about three to 4 million cases in the U S around 1% of the population has already been penetrated by coronavirus. We're at now close to 150,000 deaths and we still have a large portion of the population who's being resistant to masks either altogether or some amount of the time. We still have very vocal leaders, quote unquote, on social media, in government, influencers throughout our society who are feeding this message of distrust, right, of, you know, don't trust anything the government says, anything mask related, anything restrictive is a Democrat policy. Um, and is anti-freedom and, you know, and, and vice versa on the Republican side. Um, there's, there's a lot of, you know, well, let's, let's not question closures at all because that's also a path towards tyranny that the Republicans are trying to take us down, that the conservatives are trying to take us down, right? If you want to work, if you want to school your children in small groups, you're also a terrorist to, you know, our, our lives. Um, so we've got that on both sides. And then we've got the fact that we're not in peak season for this virus or for this disease, right? This is a virus that we know for a fact does not do as well in the heat. Can't spread as easily, can't develop as easily in the body, right? And right now we're in we're, we are in summer, right? Which is and where we should the, be getting more vitamin D. We should be at least in the sunlight, if not, right. you know, out in public, yeah, in our own backyards or wherever. Get your sunlight, right? Get at least 30 minutes a day. Even if you're quarantining or sheltering in place, you need sunlight. Um, in general, as a human being, you need sunlight, um, but you especially need it to fight this disease and this virus. Um But yeah, even the hottest parts of the country, like Vegas, where I'm in right now, we're seeing a skyrocketing number of cases in terms of where we were before the closures. Now that we've reopened, 
Um, we're seeing record numbers of cases throughout the country, um, in Florida as well, which is, an, which is a particularly hot place. Mm-hmm. So if we're seeing these numbers now, where the, you know, again, a large minority of the general public is saying, we're not going to wear masks. We don't trust with what we're being told about the virus. We don't think it's real. Fast forward six, you know, three months from now, six months from now, when we're in the full swing of winter, where the virus will be at full strength. The situation and people will be weaker from less sunlight. Will be weaker from less sunlight. The situation is going to get worse. Um, the fact the fact that people aren't going to be following social distancing measures, the situation is going to get worse. And then once we do get to a point, maybe 12 months from now, where there is a vaccine that can work for people and that can help slow the spread, how many people are going to be resistant to the idea of a vaccine altogether? Regardless of how many medical trials it's gone through, regardless of how many people have taken it, right? So we're probably seeing a situation in which both, number one, a lot more people are going to die from this disease and from the spread of the virus. Number two, where it's going to persist at at a higher level of spread and a higher mortality rate for another two to three years because of the behavior of the public and because of very vocal, um, you know, whether they're political leaders or social media influencers who are saying, don't trust anything that you're being told. Um, yeah. And who aren't really offering up a critical nuanced analysis of what they're saying. Don't trust it. And so I want, I very much want to be wrong in this, in this, you know, prediction. I, I don't want to be right, but what debate has taught me about reading the tea leaves and about how you stack a situation together, the situation that I'm looking at doesn't look like it's going to better. It looks like it's going to get worse, and it looks like people are going to be resistant to the changes that we do need to make in order to get a handle on this. It's beautifully said. Uh, you know, the homie Rostein refers to some of what he thinks and how you think and how I think as alt centrism. And I'm going to have to get him on the program to explain that further. But, you know, it's uh, it's not the centrism again of the Mitt Romney and the Hillary Clinton. Um, it, but it's not quite, you know, left wing. It's not quite right wing in the ways those things are traditionally understood. But it's this idea that comes from negotiation that we are not trying to be dogmatic and doggedly holding on to any particular stances or positions, but we're trying to dig deeper and investigate what are the underlying interests behind why we are researching and studying these matters and how do we how do we get to that? We we've ended on such a a crazy um, kind of intense, heavy subject. I want to bring a little humor while still staying on topic, and it'll be a chance for us to flex some Espanol. Tambien. So what's interesting about, and you made this distinction between Corona or Corona and COVID. Prior to this, I knew an area in the Inland Empire, a city known as Corona. I also know the popular beer known as Corona. And I have seen a lot of people, there was this long standing debate between Modelo season and Corona season. And when the novel coronavirus came around, I saw a lot of people almost irrationally, I I shouldn't say almost, irrationally associating the corona cerveza or the beer with with the virus. And so I saw their sales plummet as sort of a bad PR campaign. I wonder if they were going to change their name. So I wanted to get your take on a corona also means crown. In, in, in Espanol. So I wanted to get your take on just this word that means crown in Spanish that also refers to this place in the Inland Empire that also uh, relates to the beer and if you know what your reaction to all of that is just to end on a more silly note. Uh, I mean, so a couple things that I, that I do have to say. One is that it's just proof that fear um, doesn't allow us to make 
rational decisions, right? It literally shuts down the thinking part of our brain. When you put people in a fearful state, you can get them to believe damn near anything. Um, whether it's, you know, a scammer calling them up, telling that their car has been impounded and that they need to pay some extravagant fees via gift cards to get their <laughs> car back. Um, or people thinking that drinking a beer that has literally the letters in its name <coughs> that a very real virus <coughs> mm. need a little water. I, I, I refrained from the low hanging fruit there. If I had a, if I was still a drinking man, it would have been very fitting if I had a Corona beer there to quench. I, I was just going to ask, I was just going to ask Corona or Modelo. <laughs> I I prefer Modelo to be honest. Or Tecate. Tecate is the is the classic uh, working class man's beer, which um, if you know anything about me and my family and my history, my sensibilities lie with the working class. If you want to associate me with anything, know that my sensibilities lie with the working class. Um, as the great. Cesar Chavez, which came before me. I fight for the working class people. Um, if there's anything I represent, it is that. Um, that's, that's, that's one good thing I can say. The other thing is that, which I don't know if they're owned by the same company, um, Corona and Modelo, mm -hmm. um, but I know that they steal their water uh, from a region in, I believe it's Baja, California, that um, that is supposed to belong to uh, a native tribe there. So, wow. um, and that's the home of uh, the region of our good friend Armando Yi of Tijuana, Baja California, correct. which he calls the most beautiful city on earth. Some would say that. Some would say that. Um, it is a beautiful place. I haven't been there in a while, but it is a beautiful place. Many fond memories. Um, I have an uncle that lives there as well. Um, but yeah, um, you know. So Modelo for taste of the three between Corona, Tecate, and Modelo. And then there are different versions, right? There, there's like the Negra and what's the blonde called? Just Modelo. Oh, okay. But I do, I do like both. Um, again, in terms of taste. I like them both above uh, Corona and Tecate. Um, I've probably had more Tecate than any of the three, again, because... Affordability. Cheaper. Affordability. Yeah. It's the working class man's beer. It's what my parents, you know, and when you go to many bars, uh, for sure in California, which is where you'll find it the most, but that's, that's, the, that's, that's usually the dollar or the $2 beer special is the Tecate. It's not always hard to pass up. There's always a, a significant price uh, inflection point between that and pretty much any other Mexican beer. Um, so while I have you on the subject, the UFC, which, by the way, I consider quote-unquote martial arts to be more martial sciences. I definitely think there are artistic elements to it, but I think there are limited but uh, not not unlimited, but more limited ways in which people could win fights that there's are sci something scientific to the trial and error process when these so-called arts were put together in, in the UFC and coming together. And the official sponsor of the UFC with my Mexican-American Chicano stablemate, Brian Ortega, is Modelo. But the big fight that just happened recently was between the Nigerian nightmare Usman versus Jorge Masvidal, who's Cuban and Peruvian. But, and stay with me here, the Cuban Peruvian has worked and collaborated with a company in Mexico, and now he has his own mezcal drink. And so if I, while I have you on the, on the subject of Mexico and alcohol, I wanted to, to ask you what your thoughts were. I didn't even know what mezcal was, before Jorge, what I understood was the idea in like France of like sparkling wine as a general thing, like a, a rectangle. And then the square being the specific thing is Champagne, which is the specific city 
from what I understand, tequila is like a specific city and mezcal is supposed to be a smokier version. I don't exactly quite even know what that means. So if you could tell us a little bit about mezcal versus tequila. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert, but that's more or less it. Um, mezcal is, has a smokier flavor to it. It's, it's basically a version of tequila, um, which there are different versions. There's a sweet version of tequila, which is... Um, yeah, and the mezcal, they have a warm version and a non-warm version. Right, 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 right. Yeah, which that's that's the that's the famous mezcal or the infamous that most people think of when they think of mezcal is the worm, in the <laughs> table, which further ferments, uh, makes it even stronger, uh, in terms of alcohol potency. Um, but I myself actually have, for the most part, stopped drinking uh, for for about a year now. I respectable, can, very respectable. Can, Sorry to tempt you. No, no, it's quite, it's quite all right. Um, I can count the number of times I've had a drink on one hand, and it's been a single drink for celebratory purposes. Um, but... I've, had, I've had one beer this entire year. Um, I do not think I've had hard liquor once. If I did, I might have had it once. And I've had a celebratory glass of wine. Maybe I could count on two hands this year. Yeah, so... Um, so that's a whole other discussion, but pretty much around the time my wife got pregnant, she had to stop drinking alcohol mm -hmm. and I was never, you know, there were times where, as the Mexicans say, I would get fucked up, uh, <laughs> but, well, I was never, cool. but I was never like a consistent drinker, you know, it wasn't like something that I wore. It was like every meal I have to have. An that's alcohol. cool of you to show solidarity with your esposa. Yeah, so it was partially that, but it was also just like, you know, I'm, I'm, it's a, socially, it feels like an unnecessary cost to access to social situations. So it's easier to tell people that you've stopped drinking so that you can limit that to only occasions where, you know, because again, I'm, I'm a guy who I've experimented with restrictive eating, right, both fasting um, and just. I've taken the vegan route. I've now taken the carnivore route as well, which excellent. <laughs> I love the juxtaposition, the vegan route, surely followed by the carnivore route. <laughs> yes, it wasn't for moral purposes. It was for practical, you know, what experimentation, that experimentation. So, which yeah. I can tell you personally, um, and I don't think this is homogenous again, across the population. Um, carnivore works better for me than vegan. Same. Um, I, Specifically, I have uh, psoriasis, which is a skin condition that forms plaque. Um, still a uh, uh, very misunderstood uh, or not very well understood condition. It's an uh, what they call an autoimmune disorder, which basically means they don't know what causes it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when I did a full month of carnivore, um, it was completely gone. Um, and, and for folks who don't understand, you don't just mean meat heavy. You mean just meat? Just meat and eggs. I was and eggs. eggs. eggs but like when you had the eggs, no onions or tomatoes or anything. No jalapenos. No, the only thing I cheated with, with was hot sauce because I was desperate for flavor. I'm a man who well, grew up. That's basically salt. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm a man who grew up with a lot of. Well, there's, there's, there's in hot sauce, there's multiple. But, if you get Frank's, if you get Frank's, that's a pretty clean one. I yeah. think Frank's is permitted even like I'm on not, Whole Thirty. I'm not really Frank's guy. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good for certain things, but it's it's not the Mexican flavor. No, that it's bare bones. It's bare bones right. for sure. So I, yeah, I, um, you know, I tried it after seeing this guy Sean Baker. Yep, who, I follow him. Who, uh, he's you a know. Surgeon. Who, yeah, you look at him. He's he's a monster. He's a he's a physical specimen. He's like fifty three now. Um, fifty three, six foot one, two hundred forty pounds. Holds the world record for rowing. Can dunk a basketball. Does kettlebell swings with like one hundred and twenty pounds. I mean, the list goes on. Yeah, he can court. He can deadlift a quarter ton. He can, you know, he can do backflips. I mean, this guy is ridiculous. But, um, 
you know, again, it's another thing that's become very religious or political is the diet debate. Um, you know, yeah. quite obviously you've got the very extreme vegan uh, representatives that think it's immoral uh, to eat meat. Um, I think there's, in terms of factory farming, there's some truth to that. Um, the problem I have with it is equating uh, animal suffering to human suffering. Um, mm-hmm. Those people were out fighting against human injustice just as hard as they were fighting against factory farming. Then I might be a little bit more on board. Um, no, well, a lot of them are transhumanist. They're, I mean, you and I, again, to relate it back to debate, we encountered these people in the debate world who would say, you know, for environmental reasons, all these things, they, they say humans um, need to go. And some of maybe the more tongue in cheek and reactionary people amongst us would say, hey, um, you know, you can start with yourself, you know, yeah. that, that, <laughs> that's a great place to start. You know, I, we agree. We agree, you know, and, and, you know, some of that is permitted, you know, within the, uh, the game of, of debate. And I've seen some people say it outside of that game too, similar. And, and, and that, that itself delves into a whole nother issue of suicide. And again, again, there's, there's plenty of ground for debate in terms of, Hey, is factory farming good. No, it is, but that's, that's, that's like industrialized agriculture period. It's also not, you know, industrialized soybean farms are just as destructive to the environment as... And almonds. Right. Almonds use the most water in California. Oh, dude, almonds. Don't even get me started with almonds. Not to mention the fact that they're probably slightly poisonous to most non-Native Americans. Really? Uh, I didn't oh, know yeah. That. Oh, yeah. There's a really good book. I haven't read the whole thing, but I'm recommending it regardless. And I have to give that disclaimer because when I recommend books, I like to be transparent on whether or not I've gone all in or not. Um, I've watched more of his talks. Um, forget the, the doctor's name who authored it, but it's called The Plant Paradox. And it digs into, um, you know, more evolutionary biology about how both humans and plants have evolved to defend themselves from the fact that, you know, basically they can't really fight back. But they can develop toxins, they can develop Mm -hmm. different things at different stages of development that can negatively affect humans. Um, And that includes a lot of the things that vegans hold near and dear to their hearts um, can actually be really harmful for most humans to consume, including almonds. And and if anyone hasn't caught the relevance of why we brought this up, it's because all of these things, whether or not you're drinking alcohol, what type of alcohol you're drinking. And we've seen some people like him and I have drank less during this pandemic, but some people are drinking more. And some of that is addiction based. Some of that is, is, is just boredom, but diet is another one of these things that, you know, what vegans and carnivores can agree on is that the government fucking lied to us for years. The, the, the pyramid they came up with was utter bullshit. And um, so this is one of those areas that has been the most fraudulent in terms of science. The sciences are to be held in higher esteem than the social sciences and the humanities, but we always have to check the sciences because the scientific method itself needs to be checked. And the scientific method itself is not something that is subject to the scientific method. It's something that is relies upon the humanities. The formulation of it is a philosophical argument. It, it, you can't put an experiment to the scientific method itself. And so that's where the cyclical nature of it stops. And as Jonathan emphasized earlier, physics and math, whether you believe there's a creator or not, are the strongest. They are still the strongest building blocks and they are incomparable. They're undefeated, right? So they're the best. They are the best. And so research on it. Yeah, I'm glad you brought it back to that because again, to me, you know, for us, it's a pursuit of the truth. Um, and that's a word, again, you know, I, I, wherever it takes us, I come, I came across, you know, a Twitter profile that was saying some pretty hateful thing towards me, um, which has been pretty standard practice, uh, lately for my discussions on Twitter. Usually they end in very hateful comments being thrown around at me. Um, but this person had truth 
in in their handle. And I'm skeptical of of now anyone who puts truth in in there like I'm here to find the truth. Um I feel like the more people are using that term, the more they're actually backing away from actually interrogating um, their own beliefs, first and foremost, right? Which is, it's, again, this is, you know, Twitter is reflective of it. But to me, my search of the truth is more about interrogating my beliefs than anyone else's. And I think that's where the divide is, where a lot of these truthers or truth seekers online, they're not interrogating their own beliefs. They're interrogating everyone but their own. And it gives way to what um, is classically known as confirmation bias, where because, like you said, with the scientific method, they may be using great methods to interrogate everyone else, but because they're not challenging their own beliefs, all they're doing is confirming what is going around and using whatever method they have at their disposal to confirm what they believe, whether it's the truth or not, right? So they say they're after the truth, but really they're after confirming their own beliefs. Um, and and again, um, for me, that's 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 really the heart of the issue. Whether we're talking about coronavirus, the state of emergency within our society is that the truth is actually being tossed aside, and people are seeking confirmation and that they are selling themselves as truth seekers. Which is funny because we are the genuine truth seekers, but now you're telling us if you see that sign in their profile, view it as we would view a sign that says peligroso, view it as we would view a sign that says piso mojado. Yeah, if I see truth in someone's bio, I'm thinking this person is after anything, but they're, they're just here to confirm what they believe and tell everyone how untruthful they're being by not believing what they believe. Which again, regardless of who holds the belief, right? If the half-life of facts is around 50 years, I'm going to be wrong. You're going to be wrong. Everyone is going to be wrong about a good amount of what they believe because we're, we're not there yet. We're not at the point of maximum truth we're continually disproving ourselves every single day. And so what we believe about the virus, what we believe about what our government's doing, what we believe about what's right and what's wrong is going to change, has constantly changed throughout human society um, because the thing about human beings is that our view of life is not based on the physical world. It's based on what we believe. And so that, is, that lens is constantly changing how we interact with the world. Um, you know, I think we're very amazing creatures. We have very amazing abilities, you know, truly godlike abilities and our ability to tear into the fabric of reality, right? Literally split atoms apart, things that, you know, seem completely preposterous to our relation to the world. Um, and we're going to continue to tear into the fabric of reality. Um, what, what is at the heart of that scientific investigation has discovered, as you just mentioned, is our humanism, is the social sciences, right? How we check that, whether it's artificial intelligence or vaccines or any other type of technology or scientific discovery, is are we using it for the betterment of society or are we using it for the betterment of a small group of people? And that's, you know, that's, that's where we are right now. That's the inflection point. Um, that's what's being challenged is our greed, our arrogance. And like I said, I, I, I truly believe that um, that is a big part of why we're going through what we're going through right now. Our, our society is being challenged by the natural world, by physics, because the practices that we're engaging in are unsustainable. What we're doing, you know, no matter how clever the powers that be are and how much they're trying to manipulate the situation, 
there is a breaking point because you cannot supersede the physics of life. You cannot supersede what I believe to be God's will. And I believe that we, be- we live in a balanced world. And anytime you're trying to tip the, the scales too far in any one direction, that equation is going to break at some point. And whether or not other people, right, check what you're doing, the natural world is going to check our own practices. And that's what's happening right now. Um, and I look forward to us learning and changing and adapting from it and moving forward in a more positive way. Igualmente, there are rules to this game of life that we play. Gracias, hermano. Viva la gente. Viva la raza. Viva la raza. <laughs>